So we have discussed a lot about the productivity growth and its measurements. So as the fourth uh, lesson, I will then examine an empirical case of uh, how, uh, how productivity can be measured in practice. And I also want to connect it to this uh, interesting theme of um, measuring green total factor productivity. So uh, the green TFP is, of course, a very interesting but also challenging theme because uh, typically the uh, bad outputs do not have uh, observed market prices. And uh, this has also been a lot of discussion in, uh, in, at the OECD. And uh, several years ago, uh, the OECD commissioned me to uh, look into this and, and uh, write a report of how the, how the um, green TFP could be measured and, uh, and particularly focusing on the agricultural sector. So uh, I will include this, uh, this uh, report that I wrote in this uh, reading material. And in this lesson, I will, I will briefly describe some insights of that report. So I will consider a sample of uh, uh, 13 OECD countries. So even though I refer, refer to the countries, I should clarify that this is the agricultural sector of those countries, not the country as a whole, but just the agriculture. And then I'll consider the years uh, 1990 to 2004. So uh, at that point, when I was doing the report, that was the, the largest data set that was, uh, was available. So, so currently, of course, the, the Data is somewhat uh, already already dated, but uh, but I think it's anyway. This still still uh, in terms of methods and approaches, it's still re very much uh, uh, very much uh, state of the art. So I'll consider three kinds of variables in this uh, this uh, study. So uh, in terms of inputs, uh, when we talk about um, agricultural sector. It's uh, the classical labor and capital are obvious, but uh, I also consider land area as separate from the from the typical typical uh, capital such as tractors and other machinery. Uh, output is measured using uh, value added, and uh, then I also consider three uh, so-called environmental indicators. Uh, two of them refer to the water pollution, so there is uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And then uh, third one, greenhouse gases, then obviously refers to the to the climate change, and it's also very closely related to the to the energy use. And uh, these are of course uh, the two major environmental impacts of agricultural production: the water impact on uh, water eutrophication and uh, and uh, on on the climate change. So I will consider three types of models. So first is this kind of uh, uh, what I call economic model, uh, where I only consider the economic inputs and outputs and I exclude the environmental criteria completely. So that refers to this kind of conventional, uh, conventional TFP measurement. I'll consider the use of shadow pricing also uh, meaningful in this context. So we, we consider this kind of Monquist type of uh, uh, type of approach. Uh, mainly because uh, also labor and capital are, are quite poorly measured and, uh, and also the opportunity cost is, is uh, uh, a bit questionable. So typically uh, in Europe, the agriculture is, uh, is uh, done by family farms where, where the farmer, farmer's own labor uh, is not paid, paid any wages. So wages are only paid for the, for some seasonal workers uh, and and uh, main main source of labor is actually the the farmer and uh, his or her family, and uh, and therefore we do not really observe what is the what is the wage rate of the of the um, owner of the farm. Uh, capital stock is also, of course, a bit difficult because we typically observe only yearly investment in capital, but not really the numbers of tractors and uh, pieces of machinery or buildings and so on. So, so that's also also kind of kind of uh, difficult variable. So these yearly investment flows have been converted to a, to a stock of capital, taking into account the depreciation and uh, and uh, and deflation and so on and so on. And uh, the use of shadow prices also allows me to model uh, the land input as a as a as a land in hectares, rather than try to make some kind of uh, 
uh, price of the land into account. So obviously the, the price of agricultural land uh, also heavily depends on the subsidies, for example. So there is evidence that the agricultural subsidies tend to be capitalized to the, to the land prices and, and the rental price of land. So there are many, many problems with the price data for the, for the input prices in agriculture. So then that was the economic model. I will also consider so-called environmental model. And in the environmental model, I will then completely exclude those uh, labor and capital. I will do, I will include land area, but I will consider that as an environmental criterion. So, so in some sense, of course, the uh, use of agricultural land then, then puts pressure to the, to the, to the forest land or <clears throat> deforestation, for example. So we, we would like to have, of course, this uh, uh, land area used as uh, efficiently as possible from the environmental point of view. Uh, nitrogen and phosphorus are also measured uh, to some extent uh, in unconventional way because um, uh, typically in that kind of agricultural uh, studies, uh, uh, people look at the nitrogen uh, surplus and phosphorus surplus. However, this uh, surplus is not really, really um, uh, a stock variable. And in some years, uh, for example, nitrogen surplus might be negative, which is not really a desirable property also. So I have converted this nitrogen and phosphorus uh, uh, inputs to stock variables similar to the capital stock. So I, I, I have the yearly uh, nitrogen surplus and phosphorus surplus, and I will, I will consider them the stocks of nitrogen and phosphorus. And greenhouse gases then take into account not only carbon dioxide emissions, but also, also for example, methane is an important source of greenhouse gases from uh, agriculture. And obviously for this, this environmental criteria, there is not any, any observable market price, so the use of shadow price approach is, is, uh, is very relevant here. And of course, there could be also other environmental criteria, but this is something that I could have, could find comparable data for, for a study like this. And as a third possibility, I'll consider what, what I have, what I have called uh, the mixed model, which combines all economic and environmental criteria. And uh, this seems to be the mainstream approach in the literature currently. And uh, so to, to put all, all economic inputs and environmental our bad outputs and, uh, and everything together to measure the green TFP. Uh, I have some, some concerns about this approach, but which I will discuss a little bit later. So this is, this is why I also then wanted to show this uh, a traditional economic model and, uh, and uh, environmental model where I have excluded the, the economic inputs. So regarding the estimation techniques, uh, let me first uh, start from the semi-non parametric stoned approach. Uh, in some sense, it's just semi-non parametric regression because I do not really try to decompose this epsilon in any way. So I have just a, a non parametric uh, production function, which includes the, the variables uh, of each, each of these three specifications. I'll model the time trend uh, as, a, as a linear trend. Uh, like, like discussed in the previous lesson. So using that specification, then um, I will measure efficiency levels of the, of, the, uh, of the countries or these industries using the same classic uh, panel data treatment from, from the stochastic frontier literature that goes back to Schmidt and Sickles. Uh, so firstly, I will, I, I will take uh, geometric means of these uh, uh, regression residuals and I will adjust this uh, uh, mean residual to the, to the highest residual in the sample. So this allows me to then measure these efficiency scores or express the efficiency scores as percentages similar to, to, to the DEA literature. So basically, I have rescaled all the residuals relative to the most efficient country in the sample. And that I do separately, of course, for the, for the three models, so for the economic model, environmental model, and the mixed model. And, and then when I look at the productivity change, I, I, I look at the change in this uh, uh, residuals 
and and I interpret the technical change as this uh, as this time trend. So this is similar to the discussion in my pre previous lesson. So obviously this assumes that uh, that uh, technical change is Higgs neutral, and uh, and also technical change is constant across countries and years. So I have I, there is not there's common common frontier shift. Uh, and of course, this is also the same, same in fact, in, in any other decomposition that the technical change is the common across all countries. However, there can be, can be biases ba based on, on, on labor and capital. And that's why then the technical change rate can be different, for example, in a, in a DEA decompositions. Uh, for comparison, I also consider the parametric Cobb Douglas model. Uh, I will I will in the following slides refer to it as SFA, but that's a little bit uh, uh, this label SFA is maybe it's to some extent misleading because I do not really try to decompose this composite error term to the inefficiency and noise components. So this is just parametric uh, parametric regression, conventional econometric approach with Cobb Douglas production function. Uh, one thing I want to note here is that uh, I have in this. Um, Parametric estimation, I have uh, uh, divided all the inputs and outputs by, by one of the variables. So I have, uh, I have divided them by, by the land area. And, and this can be, an, in fact, a, a technique to enforce constant returns to scale that we, that we need for the, for the productivity measurement. So if we do this, uh, this way, then, for example, in the economic model, uh, these... Um, uh, beta K and beta L would be output elasticities of capital and labor, respectively, and then the, the output elasticity of land we could get as, as 1 minus uh, beta K minus beta L. So in that sense, we force that this uh, output elasticity is sum to, sum to 1 by construction. Uh, for DEA, I also also utilize a little bit non-standard uh, approach because um, clearly in this kind of agricultural application, there's a lot of noise uh, in our, our data. And I'll utilize this kind of uh, one variant of the so-called stochastic DEA uh, that was proposed by John Ruggiero. So uh, the idea here is that, uh, that uh, in some sense, it's similar to this... Uh, a global mounts quiz. Uh, so I'll, I'll use uh, pooled data, but rather than treat each observation uh, separately in this pool, I'll first average each each country over this time period t. So I take the average output of country country i, and similarly I take average inputs in each model specification. So for example, in the economic model, I will take uh, average labor input, average capital input, and average land area of country i. And then I subsequently just run the, the or estimate the DEA frontier using this average uh, uh, input output data. So the rationale here is that when we average over these time periods, then uh, the component of noise would be cancelled out, similar to the panel data treatments in the parametric literature, of course. Um, of course, implicitly, this kind of treatment assumes that these uh, inputs do not really change over time. So if there is some some random noise in the in the output variable that we cancel out, uh, but uh, but uh, this would be a valid approach if this uh, these inputs capital labor and land area do not change over time. Uh, this would be a problematic if this, uh, for example, if there's a, a major growth in the in the agricultural sector of some country, so that this labor and capital and land area would be growing over time. So then this kind of averaging would be would be not necessarily appropriate way to proceed. But uh, it's very simple to implement and it should be much more comparable to the, to the uh, parametric, and, uh, parametric estimation and the, and the, the stoned or semi-parametric estimation that we have considered. Uh, I also note here one drawback that uh, with this kind of averaging, uh, we cannot now separate between technical, and, and, uh, technical change and efficiency change in DEA However, we can measure productivity. So having estimated this frontier, I can actually then calculate uh, the distance to the frontier in the usual way. So in some sense, 
what I have done here is this kind of global Malmquist, but instead of pooling all of the observations, I have used averages rather than all of the all of the observations. So in some sense, the DEA measure in this uh, this case is a is a, a unique variant of the that is obtained by combining this panel data DEA with the with the global Malmquist. So that's good to keep in mind when interpreting the results as well. So let's first look at the shadow prices of the of the convex regression estimation. So this is basically just convex regression, not really really any any kind of stone decomposition of these multiple stages. So here is the summary statistics for the shadow prices of these uh, uh, input variables, and I have also here the R squared statistics, so the coefficient of determination. And uh, these are for the three models, economic model, environmental model, and the, and the mixed model. So let's first look at the R squared statistics. So that's the bottom row for the, each, each uh, uh, part of the table. So obviously, the R squared statistic will be highest when we, when we include all of the variables. So the mixed model has the, has the, has the highest uh, em empirical fit. Um, but uh, it's quite interesting to observe that the environmental uh, model doesn't fall very far apart from this mixed model, and uh, the economic model has considerably uh, lower R squared statistic. So that means that uh, the these uh, environmental variables, so this uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and greenhouse gases, actually can explain the observed output much better than uh, than capital and labor, which is, in my view, quite interesting finding. Perhaps indeed this kind of uh, biological model of, of agricultural production seems to seems to fit the data much better than the this kind of uh, economic variables of capital and labor. I already mentioned also that uh, that uh, measurement of capital is is uh, quite uh, difficult, and also the also the labor, if it's measured in hours, would for example ignore the uh, skills of the farmer and and so on and so on. Uh, if you look at the shadow prices, so the table table indicates then the the average shadow price. So in my my mind, this kind of uh, uh, values of the shadow prices look quite meaningful, both in the economic and uh, environmental model. But then, if you look compare, for example, the shadow prices in the mixed model. So, if you look at the, for example, the shadow price of the capital input it's almost 10 times higher in the economic model than in the mixed model. And also the shadow price of labor decreases quite dramatically from the economic model to the mixed model. And uh, in my view, this is, uh, this is uh, partly the problem that I see in, the, in this kind of mixed modeling of, of uh, putting, putting together the economic variables and environmental variables in the, in the, in the model specification. Because typically, of course, then the model t tends to fit better for the environmental or economic variables. So in this case, uh, the mixed model is mainly driven by the environmental variables. And as a result, then this capital and labor have, have very little impact on this, uh, on this uh, estimation. In contrast, if I have considered, uh, uh, if I look into literature, then in many other studies that I have read, uh, it seems to be the opposite case, so that uh, when when uh, people put uh, together economic and environmental variables, it might be that the model is completely driven by the economic variables and uh, these kind of environmental criteria like uh, like greenhouse gases in some other industry, they might have very little impact. So in my view, then such kind of studies are somewhat misleading to 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 present as as. Uh, some kind of green TFP or environmentally sensitive uh, TFP, because in practice, uh, uh, in models that rely on shadow prices, the shadow prices can be very small or almost close to zero. And uh, and uh, this this uh, study illustrates that that can happen also for the for the capital, for example. But of course, the same could happen for any any of the variables. So in that sense. Uh, that explains why I'm not really a big fan of this mixed mixed approach or, or calling this mixed approach as some kind of environmentally sensitive or, or, or green TFP measurement. I do not really have a good solution to this, uh, to this uh, 
dilemma yet but uh, but uh, in my view that's an that's an open open issue in the green tfp measurement uh what about the time trend so so in this uh, semi parametric um, formulation then uh, the time trend is is uh, interpreted as the as the percentage change in uh, in uh, in productivity so uh, in that respect uh, there is not big difference in the three models uh, so uh, economic model and and the mixed model both yield like uh, on average 1.6% uh, uh, technical progress per year the environmental model gives somewhat smaller but still also positive and statistically significant uh, uh, productivity growth in some sense it's natural that uh, that uh, there has been less uh, less advance in the in the environmental performance than than in in economic uh, growth because of course uh, uh, farmers would be more interested in uh, uh, technical progress in the economic uh, performance, which uh, which they get get rewarded, whereas whereas there is not such a strong incentive for Im improving the uh, environmental performance, and certainly not in that time period in the 1990s and early 2000s. So what about um, then country country specific results? So let's first look at the the economic model, and I focus first on the on the semi parametric model, which is most general, and then I'll I'll compare the results to the D this uh, panel data DEA and uh, and parametric estimation a little bit later. So firstly, if we look at the the level of efficiency, we see from this table that uh, the Netherlands is by far the most uh, uh, most uh, economically efficient. Uh, country in, in agriculture and that's not very very surprising result uh, the Netherlands has, uh, has relatively small land area but uh, but it's utilized very efficiently and and uh, the Netherlands is known for its uh, cheeses for example and tulips and, and greenhouse ga greenhouse uh, products and so on so the Netherlands is, is uh, uh, far more efficient than any other country considered in terms of economic criteria only if you look at finland uh, finland is the is the least efficient country in in this way so on average uh, comparison of finland to to the netherlands it leads that uh, finland is only 20 percent efficient which is extremely extremely low of course we need to keep in mind that this uh, this uh, economic model only took uh, uh, labor capital and land area into account uh, and uh, for example then the differences in the growth season or the temperature and rainfall and this kind of uh, climate variables uh, are not taken into account so in in that sense uh, we can always compare economic efficiency between countries is it necessarily fair to do so we can we can we can uh, we can take into account that this kind of uh, weather conditions for example can explain a large deal of that uh, that uh, that uh, efficiency differences. Uh, the second weakest country is Norway, which is also not not very much better than than Finland. Maybe also in, in interpreting the results, we also should take into account that, um, for example, agricultural subsidies are uh, very high in Finland and Norway. So such kind of issues also influence the the comparisons because the output was measured by by means of uh, value added but if the if the um if the market uh, market revenues are not really large part of the income for for Finnish or Norwegian farmers they are more relying on the subsidies then obviously also they the that can influence the efficiency um if you look at the change in efficiency and and uh, and TFP change, then of course this kind of uh, um, country-specific uh, time invariant factors such as uh, uh, growth season or, or climate conditions they they would cancel out. So it may be more in interesting to look at the TFP change or the efficiency change. So recall that in this decomposition, the TFP change is uh, is uh, driven. Uh, by two factors. So we had this uh, global technical change that I have indicated here on the bottom part of the of the figure, and that is same for all countries. 
So the countries, differences across countries can only then arise from this efficiency change. And uh, you could see that in terms of uh, efficiency improvement, uh, uh, Austria had the, had the best uh, uh, progress in terms of the efficiency change that leads to the, also the highest uh, TFP growth in that country. What about then um, environmental model? So here I have then the results for the environmental model, excluding capital and labor, but now introducing this uh, um, nutrient emissions and, and greenhouse gas emissions. So in that comparison, the Netherlands is still doing fairly well, but, but now Italy emerges as the, as the most efficient country. Um, efficiency is perhaps to some extent a misnomer for this kind of comparison, uh, because uh, Indeed, these kind of climate conditions are not taken into account. Of course, Italy is also a major, major producer of agricultural, agri agricultural pro products and uh, Italian kitchen is, of course, uh, world famous. So in that sense, also, it's, it's not, uh, not necessarily a surprise that, uh, that Italy is uh, performing relatively well in this, uh, this comparison. In terms of the level of efficiency, I noticed that the differences across countries are no longer so enormous like in the case of economic performance. And this is partly because this uh, environmental model had better empirical fit. So obviously, if these uh, input variables can explain the output better, then also there's less left for, the, uh, for this kind of unexplained part, which is goes to this efficiency comparison. The, like in the previous case, also there's this... Uh, this common technical change component of, of uh, approximately 1.2% per year. And then there is this efficiency changes. And, uh, and for some, some uh, weird reason, all these uh, countries that are in alphabetical order uh, before Italy have positive change in efficiency, whereas all countries that are in the alphabetical order after Italy have, have a negative component. That's somewhat weird, uh, but... Uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, that's how it just looks like in the data. And finally, in the mixed model, uh, notice that these results are very similar to the environmental model. So Italy is again the best performing country, followed by the, the Netherlands. So the results do not really change so much compared to the environmental model. And in this particular application, this is just because the and these environmental variables explain output much better than labor and capital. So, so the mixed model is entirely driven here by those environmental variables and uh, labor and capital play a relatively little role. So if you then compare, summarize this comparison in this, this uh, diagram, so if you look at the levels, so we see that Italy and Netherlands, they performed uh, uh, relatively well in, in the mix and environmental model, uh, but in the economic model, the Netherlands was, uh, was dominating everybody else. And the weakest performance were Finland and, uh, and Norway, the, the two Nordic countries in the sample. Sweden was somewhat, somewhat better. Uh, in terms of the TFP change, uh, then uh, results are somewhat more similar across uh, economic and environmental models. The mainly in uh, economic models, Greece has much, much weaker performance than in terms of the environmental criteria, whereas uh, Norway and Portugal had better performance in terms of economic uh, criteria than in terms of the environmental criteria. So what about the estimation methods then? Uh, in this comparison, then, then what I have labeled as, as the stone uh, with the green color, this is, of course, mainly this is convex regression with the time trend. Uh, what I have labeled as SFA is just Cobb-Douglas regression without any kind of uh, uh, distributional assumptions. And, uh, and DEA is this uh, panel data version of, uh, of DEA proposed by John Ruggiero. So uh, I, I just mentioned this, that please do not get confused with these labels. In some sense, this, all these three labels are somewhat, uh, somewhat misleading, perhaps, in this, this context. 
Uh, in any case, this uh, little bit unconventional version of DEA yields highest efficiency scores on average in this, this sample. So in all of the methods, n n the Netherlands is the, is the best performing country. And uh, in DEA case also, we need to have a, uh, another efficient country, and that will be, the, that will be Denmark. Uh, and also for France, the DEA, uh, Fr France and UK DEA approach also yields much higher efficiency scores than, than the other, other techniques. Uh, in some sense, the parametric uh, method and, uh, and convex regression approach uh, yield more similar results. And as, as you might expect, also the semi-parametric, uh, this green line with convex regression with parametric time trend, that's almost, uh, or that's consistently somewhere between this, this parametric and, uh, and non-parametric approaches. Uh, for the environmental criterion, here is the, the similar situation. So uh, for the environmental model, there are several countries that get 100% efficiency in the, in the DEA specification. Those are Austria, Greece, Italy, Netherlands, and Spain. And uh, the semi-parametric uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, parametric approaches, so if you compare the green and red lines, then only Italy is, is the efficient country in those, those cases. So as I have used this kind of uh, Smith and Sickles uh, panel data approach that I have normalized uh, the efficiency levels relative to the best performing country. So that explains why, why there's always one country that, that is 100% efficient in terms of the level. And then for the mix, mixed model, as we said, include more variables, the DEA uh, formulation, of course, includes more and more countries as 100% as efficient. So also then, then the, we have Austria, Denmark, France, Greece, Italy, Netherlands, and Spain appear as 100% as efficient in the, in the DEA specification. What about the changes in the, so this is then the economic model. And uh, this illustrates that, uh, that the changes in, uh, in TFP are then, then uh, more different when we look at changes over time. So again, I would say in most of the cases, the semi-parametric stone is, is uh, tracking quite closely the performance of this, uh, this uh, other tool, but it's not exactly the same as the average of the, of the parametric and uh, and uh, stochastic DEA. For the environmental model, these, uh, these um, three approaches yield perhaps most similar results of all. And, and the mixed model is, is very similar to the, to the environmental model. So um, as I mentioned, uh, my reservation with this kind of mixed model, which includes economic variables and environmental variables uh, in the same formulation, the difficulty is then to interpret it that, okay, is it really the economic variables that are driving the model or is it the environmental variables? In this case, it looks like it's, it's the environmental variables that are driving the results. Uh, so un unless we have a better way to proceed, I would at least propose to complement this kind of mixed model with the, with the purely environmental model and purely economic model that can, can together provide more insight rather than just, uh, just do this kind of mixed model and pretend that this is uh, some kind of uh, good measure of green TFP. It might be that it only captures the economic model. And I hope that this comparison also, even though it's not really the, the most standard DEA and more standard SFA and more standard stone, it also can can shed light to the comparison of the of this of these methods that uh, that how the how the performance of that uh, those uh, alternative approaches looks like in the in the both at the level of uh, level of uh, productivity and also the the changes, and also that can also illustrate that how in practice uh, one might. Uh, present the results of this kind of kind of uh, 
um, panel data study. Uh, when, when we go to this kind of intertemporal study, then of course, uh, there's enormous amount of uh, possible tables and figures that could be could be produced. So in this presentation, I had quite a lot of uh, a lot of results already presented. Uh, but um, if writing a report and and especially when the when the page limitations are, are binding, then uh, it's good to have some some selection of okay which which tables and which figures are most uh, uh, most interesting to present. So I believe that in this presentation I had uh, a little bit too many too many results already that it start to make potentially confusing to to follow. Okay, but that summarizes my case. So as the eighth topic, then we will uh, move beyond this kind of frontier estimation techniques and uh, look into structural change such as uh, entry and exit and, and reallocation of resources. So it's quite interesting that this kind of uh, uh, Malmquist studies, for example, have typically completely ignored the structural change. And then the studies that uh, look at structural change have completely ignored the, the, the types of decompositions in the Malmquist literature. So that will be the eighth and the final topic of this course.